Pastor Walter took us through 1 Corinthians 15, and there were a couple verses in 1 Corinthians 14, the last two verses of the chapter, that I did not touch. And then next week, we'll, we'll finish up 1 Corinthians by looking at chapter 16. But here we go. Um, the, the pick up to verse 34, you might say, Paul says, as in all the churches of the, of the saints, women should be silent in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only ones it has reached? Hmm. What's he getting at? What do you think Paul's referring to? It did, didn't it? It got real quiet here. Oh, that was funny. That was good. well timed too. Who said that, by the way? That was very good. Why, Paul? Right. Oh, that was great. Thank you. That was so funny. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, you know, Paul says some other things like this. He says, this is 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 11, verse 3. He says, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of, the, of every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, he says, be subject to one another, and he's talking about men and women, out of reverence for Jesus. So that... that Comment applies to all believers. Um, verse 22 of Ephesians 5, Paul says, Wives, be subject, here's that word again, to your husbands as you are to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Now, um, the concept of a wife being subject to her husband uh, right now is kind of like carbon-14 dating, you know, placing uh, the role of, of a wife in the Neanderthal period. That's what a lot of people think. The subject uh, is actually not hard to understand. It's hard to swallow by today's standards. It's hard maybe to work out in real life, but it's not hard to understand. Uh, it, it says that the husband is responsible for the leadership in the home. He's called the head. Uh, now, it's, it's not a cultural thing either. The basis of a husband's position in a marriage is not first century Roman culture. It's, it's Christ in the church. And the basis for a wife's submission is not first century Roman culture. It's Christ and his church. And, and the culture of the church has not changed. And I'll say that um, the, the same woman who may not want to be subject to her husband at home may be willingly going to a job every day where she is subject to somebody. And maybe it's a boss who's a man. And then she gets paid for it. It's not optional in the workplace, but for some reason it becomes optional at home. And this scripture then becomes optional. Uh, the Greek word that is used to submit, it's uputoso. Um, it's, it's the same word that's used approximately 40 times in the New Testament when submission to an authority is addressed. For example, it's used when it describes Jesus being subject to the authority of his parents. Uh, demons being subject to the disciples. Uh, citizens are to be subject to the governing authorities. Uh, the universe is subject to Jesus. Unseen powers are subject to Jesus. Jesus is subject to God the Father. Church members are to be subject to church leaders. Uh, the church is subject to Jesus. Servants are to be subject to their masters. Christians are subject to God. And here's the point. And none of these relationships are ever reversed. Disciples are never told to be subject to demons. Slaves are never told to be over their masters. Parents aren't to be subject to their children. 
or husbands to their wives, nor God the Father to Jesus the Son, nor Jesus to us. Now, Paul didn't say that the husband should be the head of the wife. He said he is the head of the wife. And women aren't the only ones who have a difficult time with this arrangement. When men refuse to accept their responsibility as head of the wife, they're actually rebelling against the position intended. If, if, do you think a, a wife is made less when she is subject to her husband? No. Uh, the same Paul who wrote these words, don't forget, he wrote in chapter 12, he, he said, or chapter 11, he, he said, when women prophesy in church, wait, 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 what's, what's prophesying in church? It's speaking. What, but he just said, women aren't permitted to speak in the church. So I'm going to clarify that in a moment. Because he does talk about prophecy. Prophecy, by the way, as Paul lists gifts of offices, apostles, evangelists, prophets, pastors, teachers. A prophet's over a pastor, a teacher. And he says, he recognizes women can be prophets and speak in the church. But they're supposed to, when they prophesy, when God speaks through them, they're supposed to have their, their head covered, which is a symbol that they're under a covering, a protection. And it would be of a man. If she's not married, it would be a pastor, an elder, a brother, her own father. Um, Paul writes Galatians 3.28. He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So the husband and the wife are equals before God. But equality of worth doesn't mean they have the same function. Jesus has the position of submission to the Father, even though they're co-equal and they're co-eternal. They got the same worth, not the same function. Peter, he wrote in his first letter, chapter 3, verse 7, he said that the husband is to give honor to the wife as the weaker vessel. Weaker doesn't mean inferior. It was Pastor Adrian Rogers. I've quoted him many times. He's the one that says silk is weaker than denim, but it's not inferior. He's the guy that said gold is weaker than steel, but not inferior. And you always keep gold in a vault of steel. You don't keep steel in a vault of gold. <laughs> Women, you're gold. Men, we're, we're steel. Our job is, is to protect, to cover you. You know, there's still debate, I don't know why, about women being soldiers. Can a woman be a soldier? She could fire a gun. Should she be a soldier? Uh, would you have more confidence knowing that 98% of the U.S. armed forces were men or women? Amen. To me, a woman soldier is an oxymoron. Amen. In war, men protect the women and children. Now, I've told you before, you know, uh, I, I met two of our, our, our South Dakota Guard's best fighter pilots, and they're women. For some reason, I have less of an issue with them being fighter pilots. Generally speaking, women drive better than men anyway in cars. <laughs> so, you know, put them in, put them in F-18s, you know, yeah, something like that, who knows. Um, <laughs> if bombs started going off in this place, I tell you right now, women will all of a sudden have this innate sense to get under the cover of a man. If, if a man in this room ducks under his wife, oh, protect me, honey. I got problems with you, buddy. Okay. We're going to take you behind the sanctuary. Um, yeah, right? So, you know, all of a sudden, man is a shield. All of a sudden, a woman knows her place and the man his. Again, he's her steel. Now, you may say, okay, I, I could understand why physically I would want to be subject to my husband, but in every other area, I mean, what if I'm superior in every other area to my husband? And maybe you are. 
but you'll find it much more difficult to freely use those superior areas if you go out from under the cover of a man. Uh, listen, our, our first father failed to insist that Eve stay subject to him. And Eve should have stayed behind Adam and let Adam do the talking. I mean, don't forget the image of that picture there. That um, she eats of this forbidden tree. And it says she turned and gave it to the man who was with her. So he was right there, silent, watching to see what would happen if she disobeyed. He should have been right between the two of them. You know, taking a hoe, cut off the, the serpent's head. He doesn't do that. He lets her take the fall. He didn't see anything immediately take place. Then he eats. What kind of man lets his woman talk to a snake anyway? You know, the enemy attacks at every area of our lives. And that's why perhaps Paul says that in every area, a woman needs to be subject to her husband. And women who are not married or are under the covering, I believe, of their fathers or their brothers or pastors or elders. But, but to the women here, I would say, I think this is what Paul is saying, get under a covering. And check in with a man that you can trust and get his read. Get his go-ahead. Get his take on what you're thinking. And it's not because he's smarter. It's simply because he's wired differently. And God is telling you, whether you understand it or not, that you need what God has wired a man to do. Women, you need what God has wired a man to do. Now, I know we live in the day of MOOCs. You know, if you know what a MOOC is, it's a what advertisers call the perpetual adolescent that shows up in all the beer commercials and all that. And they're the kind of man that a woman can live without. And it really helps feed the feminine movement, you know, feminist movement, because uh, guys are generally depicted as, as morons, stupid, sophomoric, um, perverse. It's sad. And then there's something called a feedback loop where, um, sadly, uh, young men, boys, even grown men will see those advertisements and then reflect them in their own lives. So I can understand, I understand the, the, the feminist movement. I'm not behind it, but I understand it. I understand where it came from. The absence of solid, genuine, trustworthy, and I'll say bi biblical men. But, uh, you know, the same goes without saying that the opposite is true. Men, there's no thing here. There's not a verse in the scripture that says you make all the decisions in the house and then you tell your wife to deal with it. It doesn't say the man makes all the decisions. Never check in with your wife. No. Uh, if you're smart, you check in with your wife. If you're smart, you talk to her about things because you need her opinion because you need what God has wired her to do because she's wired differently than you. It's complimentary. You, you, you help each other out. That's a whole, that's a whole concept. You know, you, you look at the opening of the scripture and you've got um, God creating this guy, good old Adam. And at one point, God creates Eve for her, as you know. And um, when it says that uh, he created her as, as a helper, our translations uh, in English usually say, um, the word is actually very difficult to translate. Ezer kenegdo is the Hebrew Ezer Kenegdo. And um, it's actually, it would be better to be translated as lifesaver. Lifesaver. Because that, that phrase, that term, Ezer Kenegdo, it actually is only used other times in the scriptures when it refers to God. When you need him to come through for you, desperately. Like Deuteronomy 33, 26, there is no one like you, God, who rides on the heavens to help. As there a negado. So Eve is already a life giver, isn't she? She's a life giver. She's a lifesaver. 
Um, nowhere does it say that um, she is his employee or slave. She's his ally. And it's to both of them that the order is given to have dominion, to conquer, to be fruitful and multiply. It's going to take both of them to create, to sustain life. And they're going to need each other to fight together. Now, Eve appears to be rather easily deceived by the serpent. And again, the way a guy is wired. Okay, let me, let me, oh, do I go there? Yeah, let me go here. <laughs> I'm amazed how often I, I find, um, and I've had, gosh, untold counseling sessions with men and women, husbands and wives, over 34, 36 years of being a pastor. And, and the number of times I, I, I meet this couple and I, I kind of get whiplash because I don't understand why she is with him. <laughs> Outside of he knew what to say. He had the right words, the right promises. And as we know, women follow their ears where men follow their eyes. And so I have met many women who I think should have checked in with somebody else, another guy, a reliable guy, and say, is this guy the guy I should be with? So why does Adam keep his silence when he should have, again, T-boned, you know, the serpent? We're talking to Eve. Did he not have something to say that would have been better? Like even just to remind her, God told us we can't touch this thing. So whoever this is, Whatever this is, is not from God. Why was he quiet? You know, I, I think it's because human nature, even when you're brand new and you're perfect like Adam and Eve, clearly from the very beginning, there's a tension and it's in our nature to not want to submit. So Adam is also not submitting. If anything, because he was silent, and she goes, well, he's not saying anything. I guess it's okay. Adam was the problem. He should have kept in submission to God. And then taken his lifesaver that he should have laid his life down for, you know, and uh, stop that conversation right there. Jan Myers, she's an author. In her, in her book, The Allure of Hope, I want you to listen very carefully to this. She writes this. Eve was convinced that God was withholding something from her. Not even the extravagance of Eden could convince her that God's heart is good. When Eve was deceived, the artistry of being a woman took a fateful dive into the barren places of control and loneliness. Now, every daughter of Eve wants to control her surroundings, her relationships, and her God. No longer is she vulnerable. Now she will be grasping. No longer does she want to simply share in the adventure. She now wants to control it. And as for her beauty, she either hides it in fear and anger or she uses it to secure her place in the world. In our fear that no one will speak on our behalf or protect us or fight for us, we start to recreate both ourselves and our role in the story. We manipulate our surroundings so we don't feel so defenseless. Fallen Eve either becomes rigid or clingy. Put simply, Eve is no longer simply inviting. She's either hiding in busyness or demanding that Adam come through for her, usually an odd combination of both. Did you catch that? Yeah. 
Read it again. I think the idea is that every, uh, every daughter of Eve has this thing. It's just, it's in you. It's wired in you just because of what's passed down to you from Eve. There is a, a distrust that Adam is going to come through for you. The sad part is a lot of us men, maybe most of us, maybe all of us actually don't come through. And it's those moments that we should have, you know, entered between her and this thing that's coming against her. And we should have stopped this thing. And because we didn't, she took the fall. And then we turn to God. We blame her. Remember how he did that? It's amazing how many men, we, we blame our wife for things. I wonder how many things we don't have to blame her for if we would have just done our job. I won't keep much longer here. Um, are we, are we tracking still here? Okay. Wives, if you're married to a Christian man, then biblically speaking, you're serving under a servant. You're subject under one who's subject. And God never asks a wife or any believer to do anything that's wrong. So biblical submission shouldn't encourage wrong behavior. It must be something right if it's in here. Correct. Uh, you're not guilty of creating a tyrant out of a man unless he must misunderstands the scripture and what submission this whole thing is about. It actually should encourage right behavior. Um, several forces, by the way, are working against a man to become what he is to be uh, in a marriage and in the home and in, in a church. The problem is we've all inherited Adam's fallen leadership traits. Just like Eve all the daughters of Eve have inherited Eve's traits of fear about the guy. Is he going to come through for me? Is he going to protect me? We've uh, inherited Adam's fallen leadership traits. Robert Lewis and William Hendricks in their book, Rocking the Rolls, where I took that from, Rocking the Rolls. He said, sometimes a man's own wife is against him. If she resists him and competes with him and criticizes him, most men will respond with retreating and they will start concentrating on themselves and their own desires. They'll shrug off their leadership responsibilities and they'll move on. And when the husband retreats, the wife will respond by taking charge. Well, if you won't lead, then I will. But let me tell you, it's the worst thing a woman can do. If she competes with him or criticizes him or constantly corrects whatever effort he does make, or steps in to take over when he fails, I don't think she can expect him to hang in there because he won't. She can expect him to withdraw. She will find that although he may not physically leave home, he will spiritually, psychologically, and emotionally. He'll withdraw. He'll find some other turf besides home in which to exercise his leadership because for him, home is a lost cause. Do I need to expand on that? They say this, where wives seek to lead, husbands seek to leave. Most men won't fight their wives for leadership. They'll just turn it over and walk away. Everything in the culture and their own sinful nature encourages them to do that. And if their own wives start fight, fighting them for control, then they'll quickly abdicate. The reality of marriage is that your husband has been given an awesome responsibility, a job, quite frankly, that is beyond him. And he needs help to pull it off. So God gave him you. It's why God gave Adam Eve, a helper, a lifesaver. Uh, you know, if we keep picking up after our kids, they'll never take responsibility to pick up their own rooms, right? Uh, and you may have a husband who is a kid, and I'm sorry if you do. <laughs> having a husband around is sometimes like having a puppy. <laughs> right? Needs a lot of attention and a lot of praise. Good boy. Good boy. 
You know, and, and when he shows initiative, give him a snack. <laughs> Scratch him behind the ears. But I guess what, what I want to get through to you is that submission, think of it this way, submission is a code word for how to train a man. Uh, a man is going to have to give account one day to God for how he led your family, but you can avoid being his alibi. Submission actually is your way of telling your husband, I believe in you. It's a way of keeping him the leader, even when he doesn't want to. And there is a spiritual attack over his leadership and the enemy doesn't want God's arrangement to work out. This subject, it, it, it really demands more than one Sunday morning. Generally speaking, I think women are more gifted than men. They're more organized. That's why they're naturally the managers of the house. I think, you know, you know what it's like, guys. If, if you and the family, you're heading out, you're going on a trip or something. Um, you have got yourself showered and dressed and packed and you're sitting in the car <laughs> complaining about your wife who then is, actually doesn't say anything. She's silent. She comes out herself already packed and the kids are dressed, packed, ready to go. We could barely get ourselves in the car, right? But, but the woman is all ready to go. Um, women actually can keep going through the day when men have usually checked out. At the end of the day, a guy, I don't know, we just have a certain amount of energy and words to say and dinner time comes and then the, we go into this coma thing. Generally speaking, and there's more, there's more daylight. There's more stuff to do. And the women are, they just, they still got initiative. They got ideas, right? They're still working. Am I reading anybody's mail in here? Are we, are we making it? Okay. I have no problem admitting that, um, I don't have the gift set that um, women have, most women have. Guys, that's us, we're, um, we're prone to be more self-centered than a woman. <laughs> the, the shocking thing is that they, is that they endure us, that they put up with us. Amen. If, if you're married and you're next to your wife, give her a little squeeze, thank her, say, this is, this is good, this is true, I love you, I appreciate who you are. Again, it doesn't say, it's amazing the things that fallen Adam, fallen men, read into that statement about a woman being submitted. It's amazing. The fallen sinful guy says, oh, that means I could teach you everything and you really have nothing to teach me. Where does it say that? I get to call all the shots. I make all the decisions, all the financial decisions, da, da, blah, blah, blah. Where does it say that? This is about, again, it's about protection. It's about, as Paul really expands on it, it's about a guy learning to love his wife to the extent where he'll lay down his life for her, just like Jesus did the church. And when you got a guy, you're married to a guy like that, is it hard to be submitted to a guy like that? But again, what does the submitted mean? It means you've said, I am with this guy and I will be his lifesaver. Women, how many times have you saved your stupid husband's life? <laughs> how many times did you know better? 
And chances are, you tried to do the biblical thing, okay, I'm gonna let you, whatever, make this decision, whatever, and then you may or may not have said, I told you so. <laughs> you should have listened to me. So men, uh, again, our job, uh, and I'm not, I'm not advocating, you know, wimpy, weaselly men. Um, I believe, again, men are to protect. And when it comes to being the head of the wife, and we talked about this uh, maybe a month ago at length, it is more about um, love and protection than authority and control. Because that's not in here whatsoever. Again, we, just, we take one word, one concept, and um, so much of the church has put these men in positions where, I've said it before, the way a lot of Christian men treat their wives, I think they'd be more comfortable in a mosque than in a church. Because there's men that treat their wives like a Muslim man is allowed and, and commanded to treat his wife like a cow. Okay. Ah. Can I give you a little more? I'm, I'm trying to paint a picture here, right? Are, am I painting it? Okay, a little more. So God has called men to lead their families in the same way that, that Jesus leads his church. And um, God wants you to love your wives. He wants you to care for them as you would yourself. Uh, and that's going to take every ounce of determination you got and every ounce of selflessness that you have. Uh, even then, you're going to need God's enabling to succeed. You'll also need your wife's submission because you can't demand that she submit to you. Not at all. Scripture urges her to submit to your leadership. But, but do you realize it never once authorizes you to give her that command yourself? It's amazing how many men say, you're supposed to submit to me. No, let, let, let God's word do the talking. Submission is actually her choice. It's her willful response. And frankly, her privilege. It's between her and God. And your focus needs to be on your servant leadership and not on her submission. I know a lot of men get bent out of shape. And I'm not talking about men in this church. I just, a lot of Christian men I've met over the years that get bent out of shape. My wife's not submitted to me, et cetera. Well, I go, are you, something, are you the kind of man she'd want to submit to? I mean, how are you loving her? How are you prioritizing her? How are you esteeming her as more important than yourself? Because submission to a lot of Christian men is, oh, I'm more important than she is. Where's that in the scriptures? <laughs> Bunny Wilson, don't know if you know of her, uh, author, speaker. She said, feminists are submitted. Feminists have organizations. They've got presidents, vice presidents, directors, and when they get into their boardrooms, you think they always agree on the direction of a particular feminist movement? Of course not. She goes, they're very opinionated women, but they know before they leave that, the, that boardroom that the president has the right to make the final decision. And they've got to graciously submit because a house divided against itself can't stand. The point is, there's never a time when any of us are not submitted. The only question is, who and what are we submitted to? Let me ask you this. If, if a man is commanded to love his wife, it must mean that she needs his love. But if she's not commanded to love him, but to respect him, it must mean that he needs her respect. You know this? How many of you have gone through the, the marriage class? Oh, fantastic. If you haven't gone through it, you got to go through it with Pastor Walter and Cheryl. Okay. Got to go through it. Emerson Agrix. I'm going to close with some of his quotes. If you've heard him before a thousand times, hang on to it. I, I heard this stuff first years ago back in Hawaii. I was just amazed by the insights this guy has. But I'll close with this. He says, and you might hear this a thousand times, but hopefully it gets through. Your husband needs respect. 
like he needs air to breathe. The same way you need love like you need air to breathe. And just as you're vulnerable and you can't function without love, God has made him in such a way that he is vulnerable and he cannot function without respect. That's why when you live without love, you react without respect. And when he lives without respect, he responds without love. Right? You're like two dogs circling each other. Right? And, and God's way of how to best love a man, it's to unconditionally respect him. Especially at the point of conflict. And that hopefully will bring him under conviction when he's at fault. Uh, this is the advice, if you remember, that Peter gave to wives whose husbands were disobedient to the word, he says, perhaps not even believers. Peter says some women uh, may be able to win their husbands over by their respect and reverence. That would be the submitting. The husbands that Peter's talking about, they don't deserve their wife's respect. But Peter doesn't say that before these wives show respect, that their husbands must first earn it or deserve it, or that these wives should first feel respect for their husbands. It's about showing respect to him unconditionally. But we've been conditioned to say that love must be unconditional and respect must be earned. And so he's to love you even when you're unlovable. And if he doesn't, then he's not showing unconditional love. And then when you get home today and he says, you're supposed to respect me unconditionally and you say, no way. You haven't loved me in such a way that's meaningful and I don't have to respect you because you're not worthy of respect. You're not going to get anywhere. Now, again, there's stuff in the word of God I don't understand. Whatever I just preached, I don't fully understand. Here's this concept. And this is the way I see it. I think females on the earth... Are, are very naturally gifted, generally speaking, better leaders in the home. They're just sharp. They got a gift set that men don't have. Let's say I'm really good at something. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so let's say I'm good at something and you're not. Am I just going to sit back and, and complain at how bad you're at doing these things? Oh, you should have done this. Or because I'm better at it than you, I actually help you. So let, 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 me, let me help you. Let me show you how to do this. Believe it or not, I believe God has given men something that is beyond men in our fallen condition. We have these little spurts often where uh, we can't have it all together. And, and we are following the Lord Jesus at, like on his heels like we're supposed to. And we might even think of ourselves as, wow, I think I've, I've finally made my wife proud of me. It's amazing how, many, how often us, that's what we talk about, don't we, men? I wanna make, we want to make our wives proud. And we're sprinters when it comes to being a good leader. Women are marathoners. So women, we need your help. Why? Because we're going to believe God's word or not. We're going to obey it or not. God says there's this, this relationship. The man is supposed to be the head. The woman is to submit to his, his headship. That headship again, always consult with your wife. Work together, be a team. But you be the protector. She can help be that lifesaver. And even teach us a thing or two. Is this clearer or murkier? Okay. Worship team, if you come up, we've got another song to sing. And, and what I want us to do is pray for a little bit here. And right now, uh, men, if you're married or not, would you right now ask God to help you see what your role truly is, that your role should be to be others centered, to think of your wife and do this right now. You're talking to God about this stuff that you would see your wife, see your kids as more important than you.
that you favor them over yourself. And that you see your wife not as your enemy. That men see women not as your enemies. They're your allies. Thank God that even from the very first pages, we are equal before him. We just have different functions. And that men, we would man up and speak up when we need to. Which means leading by example, that it's not the women who are the primary voice in the abortion fight, that it's men that finally say something. The men stop remaining silent when the snake is attacking the culture, our family members, our wives. And then pray for your wives. Pray for the women that you know to be patient as they wait for us to learn and that they'd help us as we attempt to obey what God has called us to do. Women, would you pray for the men in your life? Pray right now, envision them in your prayers to be the leader you've always dreamt for them to be. Somebody that you know is going to come through for you and not let you down and not lead you in the wrong direction. But truly love you, lays down his life down for you, protect you. And pray for yourself. That if this is a difficult concept, that uh, nonetheless the Lord commands it, that you would obey as well. And perhaps your husband then will flourish before your own eyes. Amen. Yeah.